Warning, this podcast contains violence, sexuality, gore, and other horrible and disturbing things. Listener discretion is advised. Also, the hosts of this venture are ignorant dipshits, so please do not take anything they say as fact. And enjoy the show. Now, are you sitting comfortably? Good, then we'll begin. Today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. The atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It is our basic human right to be forgot. A second plane now has crashed into the other tower of the World Trade Center. But get it all in the water that earned the friggin' frog gay. The defendant shall be incarcerated for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. We were somewhere around Barstow, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. 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 Oh, call the very charges. At 1.23 in the morning, on April 26th, 1986, safety systems were shut off in Unit 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the Ukrainian city of Pripyat. But before we continue, let's get into What's Your Poison? <laughs> so, what's your poison? <laughs> also, this is the Occulte Veritatis podcast. And I'm Ood Gallifer. I'm, I'm Leon. Oh, yeah. Fuck you. I'm Leon Felger. Paige Murray. And sitting in studio <laughs> with us. Hi, I'm Stina. Hi. Okay, so um, <laughs> Stina's been so lovely as to bring some liquor for us. So why don't you, ma'am, tell us what it is? This is some Ron Añejo, which is some sort of dark rum reserved. It's aged rum. This Ooh. one's from Cuba. I got it on a way back on the way back from a hot vacation several years ago, and I don't drink a lot of hard alcohol, so. Seem like a good place to share. <laughs> I love rum, but I've never had this sort of aged rum before. I'm not sure. My taste buds are not sensitive at all, so I think good alcohol is like spoiled on me, but I'll try it. I drink it with Diet Coke and lime. Yeah. So the only phrase I learned in Spanish was uh, ron, ron añejo con coca dieta y limón. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, yeah. that those, I, those are the top two. Where's the bathroom and your drink order? <laughs> yeah. I can tell it's rum, and it's got sort of like an earthy flavor to it that regular white rum doesn't have. And I think oh, I'm, white rum, Blech. I'm quite enjoying it. Oh yes, yeah. I'll, I'll finish this, then I'll pass it around. Yep. I'm having like a little taste. I hate shots. Ugh. Ooh, uh. Ugh. I'm not looking forward to this. Tastes like Fidel. Yeah. <laughs> Tastes like Fidel. No, Fidel is delicious, and this will not be delicious. I've turned into the into quite the light lightweight since my college days, which is nice because it costs me a lot less to get intoxicated. Ugh. <laughs> is it like rubbing alcohol? I hate shots. You, Ugh, unless they taste like apple pie or like fruit or something. Can you detect any nuances? Hints of oak. My eyes are watering. And I had like literally like a, a thimble full. Born from our fertile land, our sugarcane part pairs with the passion of our maestros roneros. In the secret of our aging cellars, these master distillers give life to one of our finest rums in the world, Havana Club. Alrighty, let's try it out. Ugh, still getting those shudders. Blah. That's actually... Thank you very much. That's actually really mild for rum, I find it. It's disgusting. It's, it's, it's kind of sippable. I like, I like like, like, dark rum with, like, ginger ale or with Coke or something. Yeah. But not, not just... Not straight up. Not plain... I, th- I think I think it m- maybe it differs on how we casually drink. Like you, you casually drink beer, right? yeah, or wine. Yeah, I, I usually just have like some rum or some scotch or, or something like that, just in a gl- or some bourbon in a glass with some ice. So I yeah, think- that's how Mister Sage Murray drinks, and I don't. Um, so I'm going to rate this uh, in honor of the Chernobyl disaster: twenty four hundred tons of lead out of eighteen hundred tons of sand. Okay, I'm <laughs> rating it m- bad memories out of gagging. I'm going to, I might drink more of this when recording is over while playing some Overwatch. So, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. This is actually nice and smooth and sippable. 
The world's worst civilian nuclear disaster took place when a reactor exploded at the Chernobyl power plant in Ukraine, then part of the Soviet Union. Present-day Belarus received 60% of the initial fallout. The radioactive cloud spread further to cover most of Europe. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant was one of the Soviet Union's most advanced facilities. The first two reactors became operational in the late 1970s. The fourth reactor was the newest, going online in 1983. On April 26, 1986, technicians prepared to test the backup cooling system in reactor number four. But the routine safety drill went horribly wrong. A nuclear reactor is like a giant steam engine. Uranium fuel rods react to produce a massive amount of heat. That converts water into steam, which drives huge turbines to generate electricity. Control rods are inserted in between the uranium to slow the reaction. And it's crucial for cooling water to be pumped around the core to prevent overheating. But as the test began, almost all of the control rods were removed and technicians lost control of the flow of coolant. Temperatures soared and extreme heat began to melt the core. At 1.23 a.m., reactor four exploded. It spewed eight tons of radioactive debris into the atmosphere. 115,000 people were evacuated from a 30-kilometer zone around the plant. The battle to put out the fires inside lasted for 15 days. More than a half a million military and civilian personnel were drafted to deal with the accident and its aftermath. 31 of the initial firefighters and plant workers died within days from acute radiation sickness. The toxicity of the radioactive cloud was equivalent to 400 Hiroshima atomic bomb explosions. On April 26, 1986, a major accident occurred at Unit 4 of the nuclear power station at Chernobyl, Ukraine, in the former USSR. A test was being conducted to determine if the turbines could produce sufficient energy to keep the coolant pumps running in the event of a loss of power until the emergency diesel generator was activated. To prevent any interruptions of power to the reactor, the safety systems were deliberately switched off. To conduct the test, the reactor had to be powered down to 25% of its capacity. This procedure, um, oddly enough, did not go according to plan, and the reactor level fell to less than 1%. The power, therefore, had to be slowly increased. But 30 seconds after the start of the test, there was an unexpected power surge. The reactor's emergency shutdown, which should have halted the chain reaction but was not activated, oh, no. failed. The reactor's fuel elements ruptured, and there was a violent explosion. The 1,000-ton ceiling cap on the reactor building was blown off. At temperatures exceeding 2,000 degrees Celsius, the fuel rods melted. The graphite covering of the reactor then ignited. The graphite burned for nine days and nights, churning huge quantities of radiation into the environment. The accident released more radiation than the deliberate dropping of a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, in 1945. Oh, I never knew that. Oh, my yeah. goodness. It's big, and it spread clouds of radioactive bullshit across Western Europe. Now, you're saying that the system that should have stopped what happened wasn't activated. Is that is that an oversight in design or an oversight in how they were running the plant? Um, I would like to introduce our guest, Stina, who uh, <laughs> is a nuclear consultant. We're calling her. Um, <laughs> uh, your question was about gas clouds? Or yeah. about, rather, why they would have switched off the reactor's safety systems. Yeah. I, yeah, so not an expert. Not an expert. Um, an I think that they turned off some of the safety systems so they could do the test the way that they wanted to try it. Uh, and I think there's some information that they did not, they thought they understood how the reactor worked, but they were mistaken. There was some information being withheld. It was Soviet-era times. They were not sharing. So there was something about the control rods that would have... Uh, stopped the reaction had carbon tips so mm -hmm. when they entered the they were completely removed and when they entered the water they actually set off this reaction instead of the boron going in and stopping it oh my goodness yeah it's screwy but soviety <laughs> soviety yeah, yeah. and I guess I feel like I should speak up as, as somebody that works in a factory that has to deal with safety systems all the time Never let one of your coworkers like duct tape the safety switch down or any of that bullshit. There's, 
There's a thousand videos online of people getting killed by doing that, getting sucked into machines, and the thing that should have stopped them is being held down by duct tape or some weight or being gone around in some way. So during the accident, uh, steam blast effects caused two deaths within the facility, one immediately after the explosion and the other compounded by a lethal dose of radiation. Over the coming days and weeks, 132 servicemen were hospitalized with acute radiation symptoms, of which 28 firemen and employees died in the days to months afterward from the effects of acute radiation syndrome. In addition, approximately 14 radiation-induced cancer deaths among this group of 134 hospitalized workers were to follow within the next 10 years, Jeez. until 1996. Hello, I'm Dr. Ziad Kazi, a medical toxicologist working with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Scientists have been studying the effects of radiation on the body for over 100 years, so we know quite a bit about how radiation interacts with living tissue. Let's take a closer look at how the amount of radiation our bodies receive, otherwise known as the dose, can affect the cells in our bodies. Once a cell is damaged by ionizing radiation, three things can happen. One possibility is that the cell can repair itself. The cell would then go back to normal. Another possibility is that the damage is not repaired or is misrepaired, so the cell is altered. This alteration may eventually lead to cancer. The third possibility is that there is too much damage to the cell and the cell dies. Among the wider population, an excess of 15 childhood thyroid cancer deaths were documented as of 2011. It will take further time and investigation to definitively determine the elevated relative risk of cancer among the surviving employees, those that were initially hospitalized with acute radiation syndrome, and the population at large. Now, the Chernobyl accident is considered the most disastrous nuclear power plant accident in history, both in terms of cost and casualties. It is one of only two nuclear energy accidents classified as a level 7 event, which is the maximum classification, uh, the other being the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear disaster of 2001 in the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami. Fukushima was 2011. The struggle to safeguard event scenarios which were perceived as having the potential for greater catastrophe together with later decontamination efforts of the surroundings ultimately involved over 500,000 workers and an estimated cost of 18 billion rubles or approximately 4 Canadian dollars. <laughs> the remains of the number 4 reactor building were enclosed in a large cover which was named the object shelter, often known as the sarcophagus. The purpose of the structure was to reduce the spread of the remaining radioactive dust and debris from the wreckage and the protection of the wreckage from further weathering. The sarcophagus was finished in December 1986, at a time when what was left of the reactor was entering the cold safety shutdown phase. The enclosure was not intended at a as a radiation shield, but was built quickly as an occupational safety for the crews of the other undamaged reactors at the power station, with number three continuing to produce electricity up until 2000. And that, that sarcophagus, I guess that was more to protect like the radioactive dust from blowing like out of the area, right? Yeah. And after the thing exploded, like it contaminated the entire city. Priya, Priya Prit or something. No, that's not Priya Prit. That, that's the way I pronounce it. And it's Pri not correct. It's Pripyat. Okay. Pripyat, yeah. Pripyat. Right. Okay, so the, the entire city of Pripyat was uh, evacuated. Mm. And you can see like really cool pictures on BuzzFeed now, the before and after, because the, the city is literally a ghost town now. No one lives mm. there. And you can see the, the ancient remains of old swimming pools and rusted mm. playgrounds and part of a theme park they had there with a roller coaster and shit that mm -hmm. yeah, it's they interesting. had to abandon. Yeah, it's, it's like haunting cool. to see it. Yeah. I think it was a really nice town like they were really wealthy right mm -hmm. the people who worked there so it they was, set yeah. up a nice town for all the families of the people who worked at the plant mm -hmm. yeah. and then they left thinking they would come back yeah and and there's actually photos from schools where people's stuff is like literally left on the desks no one's come back to take it i mean wor working at a nuclear station that has to be a pretty i guess specialized job it probably has pretty good pay associated with it so that it would probably be a pretty you know high class community and with stratification and all that like it could be a very wealthy city Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was one of the better jobs you could get in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. So that was part of the reason why they maybe didn't say no when they should have said no to what they were doing. They didn't want to lose their jobs. Right? Yeah. Yeah, if any of you out there are interested in apocalypse movies, just look up some of the pictures and we'll have them up on the social medias. But you can see just what it looks like to have... I guess nature start to take something back that humans once owned. Yeah, it's like creeping in. It's cool. Yeah. It, it's pretty cool because um, like 36 hours after the accident, um, they had evacuated a 10 kilometer radius around it, including 49,000 people. So it was, it was a pretty major Jesus. evacuation effort. 
Um, and although it wasn't communicated at the time, the immediate evacuation of the town following the accident was not advisable um, as the road leading out of the town had heavily nuclear fallout hotspots deposited on it. Initially, the town itself was comparatively safe due to the favorable wind direction. Until, that is, the winds began to change direction, oh. shelter in place was considered the best safety measure for the town. <laughs> like they do. <laughs> yeah, and uh, over the next few days, after the plume of radioactive bullshit in the air continued to grow, uh, they had to evacuate 68,000 people, um, of which the, the first two totals, 135,000 people never returned to their homes ever. Jesus. And you can imagine, like, imagine somewhere in your city, some factory goes up, and suddenly you have to leave or die. Yeah. So immediately following the disaster, obviously, this sort of spawned the modern anti-nuclear movement. Mm. Um, and in Saskatchewan, there's there's sort of a, a local story in that Saskatchewan produces what percentage of the world's uranium? It's... I don't know. It's a lot. Most of it. But yeah, we have two of the highest grade uranium deposits in northern Saskatchewan, so... Yeah. It's a lot. Uranium is is our thing, uh, and potash. But potash mm -hmm. is more delicious than uranium. I actually um, talked to a potash expert the other day. You can grind up potash and put it on your food in place of salt. Oh. And the lethal limit is only like two point eight blah 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 per blah blah blah. Whereas for table salt, it's three point one. Oh, so you can definitely eat potash on your food. So so yeah. I'll, I'll die from eating table salt before I die from eating. No, no, you oh. die potash. from the potash first at two point eight parts oh. per blah blah oh. blah. But oh. at, yeah, three from point potash two. straight yeah. up. Okay, straight up potash because people with uh, I think like high blood pressure and things that need to reduce their sodium take chloride potassium take that comes potassium from potash, chloride, yeah. which is similar. But I don't know if you want to grind up what they pull straight out of the ground. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> That's the thing that the chemist I spoke to had sort of said because potash can describe a wide variety of things. It's not mm. just that particular blend, but it, it can be any sort of sort of what did you call it um mix mix yeah it's a, it could be any sort of mix as long as there's lots of potassium chloride in it mm. and then other assorted goodies but yeah the straight up potassium chloride you can eat and i would suspect in low doses whatever shit comes with it you could eat as well yeah but i will report back because i fully intend to grind some potash and eat it oh good saskatchewan is the world's second largest uranium producer after france I think after Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Yeah. Yeah. For the, like, pulling it out of the ground. Yeah. 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 Saskatchewan accounted for approximately 22% of the world's primary uranium production. Isn't that where Borat was from? Yeah. And uh, the second largest producer behind Kazakhstan. Hmm. Yeah. Well, shit. I learned something today. And I did too. It's kind of funny that Saskatchewan has a, f a fairly strong anti nuclear stance when we produce. No, we don't. No, we fucking don't. No, we don't. don't. We live well, in the. Well, the, pol the politicians. Do. No, they don't. Yeah. No, no. If the SAS party wanted to build a massive nuclear reactor in Davidson, they'd do it tomorrow. It's just unpopular because of things like Chernobyl and Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, there is a not in my backyard for the reactor oh, way, sure. but it's also yeah. because Saskatchewan mm. has so few people. We have much uh, less demand for power. Mm. Um, so Canada has reactors in the east. Chalk so River. In, and yeah. In Ontario, New Brunswick mm. and yeah. places. So a lot of those are candy reactors and the uranium mostly mm. would come from Saskatchewan. But it's accepted in those communities, not mm. here. Oh, or, and partly not needed here. We wouldn't use it all. Like one of those reactors would be overkill for the whole province of Saskatchewan. We'd have to share. Well, and sense. they talked about building some research reactor at the University of Saskatchewan that was very nimbied into the ground, which I'm comfortable with, I think. I'm, I'll am i admit that I'm mostly ignorant about nuclear <laughs> power, but I am terrified of it and so opposed to it. But it's been argued to me that it can be good. <laughs> Mm. So the, I think it's the, is it at the Sylvia Fedoric Center that we now produce all of the medical isotopes for the world? Uh, right. And that used to be Chalk River, but that was failing, like wasn't working well anymore and they wanted to shut it down. So we, pro I think we produce all or most of the uh, medical isotopes mm. for the world. So those are really important. That's to do special scanning right. to look for things and, and also including to detect and also treat cancers and things like that really targeted. Mm. Yeah, cool. that's important. There's good things that can be nuclear. Nuclear doesn't mean <laughs> always bombs. Terrifying. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that's really scary about it, you think about that town. You know, that night they some of them maybe saw mm. that uh, there was a fire or something. But one of the things that I think is so scary about radiation is that you cannot see it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like just really terrifying. If you give me some, you know, green smoking goo yeah. or like a, a chemical weapon or something like that you can tell right away 
what it's doing to yeah. you and yeah. it and you know and you know how to maybe get away from it as well and with any kind of radiation you can't, you can't see well it. that ionizing radiation like that it's so high energy that you can't see it and it can go through your walls and it's just this really scary yeah. thing but if you are uh measuring it and you know how much there is mm -hmm. it does not have to be scary we get a whole bunch all the time mm -hmm. it's there's a lot in saskatchewan actually we have a ton of we actually have problems with ionizing radiation from radon that's just naturally in the ground mm -hmm. it comes up in the spring thaw so mm -hmm. if you live in a basement you should get it uh tested i had actually thought radon about opening gas. a business called saskatoon radon detection services and i was going <laughs> to buy the small kit from the lung association and i was going to go around like 100 bucks a basement i'll check for your radon and then Mrs. Leon Filger told me that was unethical because it was fear mongering. Hmm. But I. It's not unethical if you're properly testing for radon gas. I, and I would test. I would test very, very carefully according to how you're supposed to do it. But I would charge people $100 and tell them radon could be lurking in their basements, which is true. I, I it, think it I, is kind of true. I, I think it's, it's, how, it's how you frame it. Like if you, you check the corners and you check around the drain in the floor, that's where the radon hides. And yeah. radon could be hiding in your basement right now, Saskatoon. <laughs> <laughs> Call Mr. Leon Felger if you want your radon. Yeah, so the, radon so the best services. way to test is uh, you actually have a detector for at least, I forget if they say 30 days or it might even be 90 days. That's mm. a lot of money for me to stay there for 30 no. days. No. So that's the thing. It's not usually like one guy in the basement. <laughs> that goes it's, your plan. A, it's a small detector in your lowest occupied level. And you just leave it there. So it gets more the average. Like a the odd spike detector? doesn't matter. How much could I charge people to rent that for 90 days? Um, they, there's a cost to it. I, I've actually done it. So um, I forget. how It wasn't very much, though. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell them that. And then they did the analysis as well. Oh. Yeah. Next up on yeah. Shark Tank, Leon Filger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally yeah. gonna do but it. that's a legitimate risk. Another yeah. legitimate radi ionizing radiation risk is for um, flight attendants, pilots, people who are oh. up in the air all the time getting oh. the higher intensity and cosmic astronauts. radiation. Uh, astronauts, for sure. I think they have a lot better shielding than... Oh. In, in yeah. only one of the, <laughs> their habitation module is shielded. Their science modules are not. So mm -hmm. they always sleep inside the... The coded, but yeah, they're still being exposed to huge amounts of radiation. There was a, an experiment that was done last year uh, with Scott Kelly, who is an astronaut, uh, and his twin brothers, identical oh, right. twin brother on the yeah. ground. And so, of course, Scott Kelly was, was up there for almost a year absorbing yeah. cosmic radiation, and his brother wasn't. And they looked at some of the physiological changes in his body, and holy shit, that's yeah. crazy. That was a question on my but, trivia. But that's night. not just ionizing not radiation. Just, Maybe not, you, not at all, right? Yeah. Possibly. It depends on what the effect was. Cosmic it's also rays. the... Probably more the ant than less gravity would right. be the biggest effect on they your body. They look physically very, like you, you look at pictures of them and they look very different. I, I took a trip. Arriva actually flew me to one of their mines um, at McLean Lake a few years ago to see their operation. Mm -hmm. And I got to hold a bag of uranium, which is incredibly heavy. If I've you imagine lead and make it like 13 or 14 percent heavier than that. Oh, geez. It's incredible. Yeah. And they said, don't hold it for very long. And don't hold it against your genitals. Just hold it to one side, <laughs> and then let's go back the fuck in there. Yeah. Um, but they also did a demonstration. And I, I mean, part of the skeptic in me says this was propaganda. But they had one of the watches uh, that they used to have back in the days with the glowing face on them. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember the name of the chemical they put on them. Lumen something. I don't know. You're thinking of luminol. That's, the, that's the blood detecting shit. Let's Google it. Anyway, the... the Women who are working on building these watches were also like painting their faces with this glow in the dark oh, shit. Oh no! And it's it's not glow in the dark; it's glow in the day. It's radioactive, whatever the hell it was. Radium. Yeah, like kryptonite. Radium. radium. It was radium. That's yes, right. Yes. Yeah, radium sa watches. A save so from Tira. They they had a radium covered watch there, and they waved the Geiger counter in front of it, and like, holy fuck, this shit's radioactive. And then to the lump of ra uh, uranium that was a quarter of a kilometer away. See, no biggie. And yeah. I thought, mm. that's bullshit. But it's not. Is it not? No, it's really not. No, we used to have, ura uh, yeah, I think uranium glass. It's mm -hmm. got a green tinge to it. Oh, we have uranium glass. And yeah, it's it's radioactive, but at a really light level. And in, you know, in a mine like that, you're going to get counts, but you're going to get counts in the potash mine too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so it's actually, uh, that's, I mean, one issue is if you're not measuring it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't see it, you can't feel it right away. You've got to be measuring it. So if you're in a not uranium mine, 
uh, you've got to be still measuring it and have people who know at least a little bit about it. If you're in a uranium mine, you are guaranteed that you are controlling it so Mm. so well. And ventilation is the big thing. Yeah, that's fair. For the radon gas again. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's totally legit. The the doses that you get, so it's like thinking about the Chernobyl, I mean, those are out of this world, like mm-hmm. absolutely, that they got radiation sickness, you know, in a in few minutes or something, mm-hmm. I think a couple of the people, the doses that you get at any operating mine right now or any other sort of processing facility are so low. They're, they're so below the, uh, like the, the guidelines. Um, you just get almost nothing the way that because we have so many safeguards and because they do ventilation, they've learned so much, but they learned a lot of it the hard way. So I believe you. It's not like it was, (laughs) it's not like it was like that before. Right. And then you think again about the Soviet era where they were closed off from the rest of the world, not Mm, sharing. So they were doing their own research, but the, and not saying that the rest of the world was necessarily that much better uh, than, than the Soviets, but I think there was a different culture that, you know, don't question authority, I think do what you're told, know your place. Probably. Yeah. If you look at, I mean, Russians drinking and driving and not wearing seatbelts, the cavalier attitudes towards safety in the former Soviet Union are startling if you ever watch videos of drunk Russians on YouTube. And I feel like their nuclear safety would be sort of along that lines back in the early 80s when yeah. this went down. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think Russia has a very, like, independent attitude like they wouldn't want to they wouldn't want to follow the safety regulations of the western world just because the western world wants them to they would come up with their own Mm -hmm. and unfortunately after after world war ii after they lost millions and millions in the red army of of young men like they were really hurting for new ways to to jumpstart their economy and keep their country going Mm -hmm. that's very fair i guess in a contemporary context can we do without nuclear power because it seems to me a lot of these power plants Mm -hmm. are operating in places where the sun doesn't shine too terribly often uh and it would be unrealistic to put up wind farms i mean i'm i'm very much of the nimby leave it in the ground crowd i do understand the importance of generating medical isotopes i feel like you perhaps do that in a smaller reactor somewhere at the north pole or in the middle of greenland let's (laughs) let's generate our medical isotopes there so i guess going around the circle We'll start with Sage. Nuclear power, yay or nay? I think I'm for nuclear power, as long as it's done safely. Like, I don't really, honestly, I don't know much about it, but if it's been tested and proven safe, then why not? Could, mm-hmm. I, could I go on a bit of a tangent? Go for it. Well, there was a thought experiment in the early 2000s about how they could label Yucca Mountain. Now, Yucca Mountain was a place that they I were... I think des- it's just Yucca. Yucca Mountain. Um, but basically, that mountain was chosen as a dump site for the nuclear waste of the USA. And, and it never got used. Yeah. But the, the thought experiment, they brought artists and philosophers and professors all together to answer one question. This radiation is going to last 30,000 years. In 10,000 years, when the radiation is still deadly, how can we tell the people of that time not to go near this mountain? And... Like, w- look at how the English language has changed in just a thousand years. It'll be unrecognizable in 10,000 years. You can't use any conventional English message. And using pictures to represent stuff, like the skull and crossbones to represent poison, that's something that makes sense in our culture, but 10,000 years from now, that might not. So there was no real solution found in how to tell the people of the future, don't go near this fucking mountain or you'll die. I and think when they go near the fucking mountain, they'll find out. Yeah. Were, were they assuming that there would be discontinuous, like, human occupancy? I don't really I don't understand know. that. I, I think I think they thought that, like, worst case scenario, they lose track of Yucca Mountain. It's at, just Yucca Mountain. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, you were right. They yes. Yucca Mountain, and worst case scenario, they lose track of it, or it, get, it gets lost in some disaster or some human war or something like that, and the people of the future still need to be warned about it. I, I guess I'm pro-nuclear, as long as they can find a reliable way of storing the nuclear waste. Finland is doing an okay job at that. They're building, right now, a massive, massive underground facility that could mm. take all of the world's nuclear waste. Oh. Uh, yeah, they've got it. 
I'll do an episode on it. Actually, I want to do an entire episode on Finland and why it's awesome. Okay. Oh, I love and Finland. I will include that because I love <laughs> Finland. And I should come for that one. Yeah. Too. Would you like to? I've been there. Fantastic. You may. <laughs> and I, I know a bit about the geology of Finland. Like they have good bedrock to dig into, so there's no there's no real underwater. No one is geologically stable. Yeah. There's yeah. no earthquakes in Finland. Yeah. So that's kind of a nice place. But like some, I, I guess I'm uh, I guess I'm pro nuclear as long as Finland comes up with as long as Finland's plans are as golden as they oh, usually they. are. Yeah. My turn. Yeah, your turn. <laughs> okay. So I'm obviously pro safe nuclear power at least for now. Yeah. Uh I looked at this many year many years ago and uh it, in particular compared to using uh oil and gas, mm. I think that yeah. nuclear power is clearly the better answer. In most cases, I mean, to that for for base load nuclear power, I think that uh, solar especially has come up so much faster than we expected, and I I think and hope that that could probably change again and you know revolution in ten years, yeah. And storage and all of those kinds of things are changing so fast that maybe the need for it will be gone, you know, as a base load power source will be gone sooner than we think. But mm. I think right now, it's it's great. It's way better than some of the alternatives to it. And it's also, uh, for the most part, being conducted with incredible safeguards now, it's particularly since Chernobyl. But we can't really get away without uh, bringing up Fukushima. Yeah. Mm. So I think that for a long time, many, many people thought, oh, Chernobyl never happened again. You know, a flawed reactor design, Soviets who weren't sharing information, the people mm. at the controls didn't... Hun- fully understand what had happened, weren't told about previous uh, minor incidents that could have informed them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this will never happen again. Mm. It it hasn't. I mean, Fukushima was nothing like this. Mm. There were no radioactive related deaths, nothing like that. Uh, but it was still a complete meltdown that needed to be contained that took, you know, I don't know how many people, hundreds of thousands of people maybe to help over over those these years as well. Um and just didn't think it could happen. So maybe we should not have them in earthquake tsunami prone areas. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. I would be, I I'm okay with that. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you worry about, for example, Saskatchewan uranium, which is powering nuclear power plants around the world, ending up in nuclear weapons? No, I do not. Okay. Why? The International Atomic Energy Agency, mostly. Every speck of uranium is. Uh, sort of tracked, especially once it get, starts getting processed into things that could become uh, enriched. It's tracked. It's got, there's so many safeguards there. There's inspections. There's, you know, lots of things happening. Not, I mean, obviously something could happen, but but no. And, and in fact, uh, some uh, weapons grade uranium has been uh, brought into the fold and processed into nuclear reactors. So we're taking, Interesting. we're taking the material away from weapons. Okay, I'm satisfied. Cool. I learned so much about science today, you nerds. I did. It's a good science episode. <laughs> Uranium is your friend. It is. No. <laughs> it's and it's nuclear. Nuclear. Yeah. Um, any other comments, questions, queries, concerns, statements, or outbursts? Huh? Nope. That's uh, been Occulte Veritatis Podcast. <laughs> I'm your host, Leon Filger. Sage Murray. Ood Gallifrey. And in studio with us. Stina. Have Thanks. a good night. Love you bye.
the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving mid the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Taken untold millions that they never toiled to earn But without our brain and muscle not a single wheel can turn We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn That the union makes us strong Solidarity forever Solidarity forever Solidarity forever In our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of atoms magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. can break their haughty power gain the freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong strong. welcome to the after show (laughs) oh that's right did you just hear leon's voice on the after show did you just hear sage chewing into your ear oh my that's what i was doing that's right from here on in all three hosts are gonna appear on the after show it's no longer the ood show i don't need this one that beer is disgusting your face is disgusting i'm just kidding your face is pleasant Alrighty, so first off, we have to welcome uh, two new occultists, oh, which is $5 a month level patrons. Love you! Would you like to read them off? Yes. Leon Filger. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! <laughs> About <the> goddamn time. <laughs> and Jen Makowski! I know you, Jen! I married you. Bye. Woo. Love you. Yeah, Thank this. you. And uh, we also have a new uh, level in the Patreon, which is called Occultist Edgelord. I think I'm d- actually, like... <clears throat> Recorded as a five dollar patron, but I, I totally donate six dollars and sixty six cents. Oh yeah, yeah, and so, so does Jesse, our moderator, our wonderful moderator. Oh, I love Jesse. Oh yes, but Occultist uh, Edgelord. So the normal one costs five bucks a month. The Occultist Edgelord costs six dollars and sixty six cents uh, cents a month. It's that much cooler. Oh yes, and we have to welcome into uh, into the Patreon family as Occultist Edgelords Brandy Matthews. Love you, Brandy. And Kim Perkins. Kim Perkins. Love you, Kim. Oh yeah. I think I follow Brandy on Twitter. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think uh, I think she put up a tweet when she uh, went to the Patreon as well. She was like, oh, I'm a part of uh, the Occulte Veritas Patreon, so you should join too. So thanks for the shout out. Yes, we love you. Okay. Uh, next up, we're going to announce uh, the new polls. So, already, uh, Leon had... I like that. Had Colonel Russell Williams <laughs> for all three of his choices, and surprise, surprise, that's the episode we did. No, the one that won... Was it garbage person, Colonel Russell? Oh, sorry. Yeah, the, the three choices were Colonel Russell Williams, David Russell Williams, or garbage person Williams Russell. <laughs> and garbage person Williams Russell won Hooray! with 10 points. So that'll be this episode. Uh, for Sage polls, the three choices were R. Kelly Sex Cult, mm. Albert Fish, and the 12 Tribes of Israel. Um, so the winner with nine votes is the R. Kelly Sex Cult. So that awesome. episode will be recorded on our next recording night. Yes. And, of course, Albert Fish came in second, so that'll be going on the next poll. Mm-hmm. Uh, for my choices uh, were Pokemon, the incel community, and the John B. Calhoun rat experiments. I voted for incels. Oh, yes. Most people did, because with ten votes, the incel community is the winner. Um, if you want to influence these votes, just join the Patreon. And Can we call incels a community? It's really just like a shithole. The incel shithole. Yeah. I don't know. It's still a community. Yeah, I, like I would, I would say like the Nazi community is still a community. I get I that. Suppose. I get Even that. It's full of garbage people. I, I think it's just because when you think of community, you think of like you know a happy little village where everybody's like supporting each other and all that. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, do we want to announce the new poll um, options? Yeah. 
Okay. So my next three options are going to be, my runner-up was Albert Fish. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave him on. And 12 Tribes of Israel, because I still want to do that. And also the Denver Airport conspiracy theories with that weird blue horse and all the crazy murals and stuff. Yeah, that's going to have some art interpretation. So Mm -hmm. I'm super excited for that. Okay, so for me, I've got mm-hmm. uh, infant genital mutilation, uh, seekers of Antarctica. Mm-hmm. Ooh, yeah, and the iridium layer. Already, I don't even know what that is. Now, Leon does not often grace us with the option of three different options. This so is like a once in a lifetime opportunity, pretty much. Take advantage while you can, people. <laughs> I'm still going to do whichever one I want. <laughs> oh yes. Um, my next three are going to be. The Bone Wars. Whoa. Sounds with, like something out of a young adult novel. Uh, it kind of like is. It's basically two rich white idiots fight and destroy dinosaur bones. Sounds <laughs> like me and Richard. <laughs> it does, actually. Um, I'm also going to do... Um, my second option is going to be the body after death. So I'm going to tell what happens in a cremation and a natural burial. Mm-hmm. What happens if you get embalmed and then buried? Uh, what happens to the body after death? And awesome. you're having an actual funeral yeah. expert on the show. Oh, yes. Yes, we, Mr. Leon Fielder has lined up. And, of course, um, the second place option, which is going to go back on this one, is the John B. Calhoun rat experiment. Still put Pokemon on. Uh, sure, and we'll have a fourth option for Pokemon. Yeah. I, I know people. I know people don't have confidence in the Pokemon option. There's some fucked up shit, man. There is. There's some fucked up shit. I guarantee it. Yes, it'll be a good, really good episode. Already, I vote you vote for that one. Sweet. <laughs> and just to let you know what's entering our black archive this month. It's going to be uh, what is on there right now is the cock pock snatch apocalypse. Yes. Where we review all the Dick and Snatch and any other part pictures you sent into us. But mostly Dick and Snatch, because if you're sending in pictures of your pinky four at a time, that's wasting our time. Yeah. Give us cock and snatch. Yes. <laughs> um, we're also going to release us doing a supernatural belief test, and oh. something that is going to be released in the future that we're actually going to record tonight is we're going to be going through the list of questions that make people fall in love. Nice. And we're going to fall in love as a three. Cool. Um, I'm excited. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So now that everybody's nice and, uh, and uncomfortable, this is the after <laughs> show with Ood. And Sage. And Leon. Love you. Bye. Bye-bye.